Thanks, Chris, for that, and, and thanks to all the presenters. Uh, we've got about um, 10 minutes or so for, uh, for some questions, uh, and so I'll open it up now for, for any questions out there. Well, you th well, there's one up there, and I'll ask one. Yeah. Have we got a mic? You might just have to yell. The productivity's really lifted. We're, um, we're seven times the area average carrying capacity. So we're producing seven times or six times more kilos of beef than our neighbours are. Um, but initially, like I said, um, it's, it's, um, it's that initial transition phase that is extremely financially difficult. And current funding models don't allow for that. Banks don't allow for that down downside in doing that and hence why I'm sure there's not more uptake of, of change management practices in grazing. Yep. Thanks. Uh, I'll just, uh, well we've got one more coming. Hello, I'll, I'll just ask you one around um, adaptation responses. Uh, you gave some historical examples there of, of adaptation responses and, and said they're not predictive but they're indicative. Um, there is some complexity with it because a lot of those were built at the, on the back of, at the same time, big productivity increases happening uh, in agriculture through, through technological gain. And over the last decade or so, we've seen those productivity gains slow. So looking forward in terms of adaptation responses with those sort of current constraints, uh, how do you see adaptation proceeding? Thanks for the question. Um, right. Well, first thing to note that um, adaptation is not triggered by one particular one, which may be more influential than others, but it's interacting with other drivers. So in the past, as you rightly pointed out, ill games was one of the main contributors. And those who were in the productivity uh, session yesterday, seeing that um, structural adjustment through deregulation um, and other policy changes contributed quite substantially to that. So going forward, I think technological advancements um, will contribute. Uh, the continued structural adjustment will contribute. Um, and um, with regard to technological, I think the precision farming, I, I shouldn't be talking much on that, <laughs> sitting next to Natalie, but you know, that's an untapped um, it's been taken up in, in, in Australia in many places, but uh, still the take up is not uh, um, more than 20% in many places, so that's another one. So I see a few things in, t in terms of policy, further deregulation or flexibility in terms of responding to market signals or other uh, drivers. Um, that's through structural adjustment, technological um, advancement and uptake. Um, in terms of um, role for government and, um, and private sector, I think going forward, information is the key currency. Uh, information about climatic conditions, technology, market, and all that. So that's another thing. So um, I don't have any definitive answer to how to tackle future challenges and all, but it would be a combination of the things I've mentioned coming from policy, coming from technology, and uh, information systems. Okay, thanks. Peter. Um, Chris, thanks for the uh, insights on such a complex topic. Um, I guess uh, if Carl's talk is only half right, we are greatly undervaluing um, mitigation. Okay? So if there was a stable price on carbon that was um, would, do you think the social and political factors would fall in line? So obviously at the moment, the low price of carbon and the instability on that is a, it makes everything so difficult. If, for example, that was solved, would these other things flow? Yeah, over time they would. I mean, one of the interesting things is um, whichever carbon market you have looked at with any form of stability, funnily enough, it's always become oversupplied. And, and the reason for that is 
markets actually do work in a way that they're supposed to. And, and the funny thing about throwing a problem to a market is you end up with a whole lot of innovation that was not expected. And so you'd actually see, I think, a whole lot of innovation which would help deal with some of those problems. Not universally, though, because we do have uh, some real challenges when you are trying, when any society is trying to uh, produce a, a, a significant change and, and taking a different industry or, or perhaps related. If you look at some of the challenges associated with the wind industry, they've been uh, quite difficult and it's been a few steps forward and many steps back. But, I, but with enough time, I think these things can be resolved. We do think of, of landscapes as being static and they're clearly not. Question up, up the back there. Coming on the question you asked well before, I noticed in your slide that you saw that in the drier years wet production increased and you drew the conclusion that that was due to a lack of information and lack of confidence in the future forecast. I was wondering if you consider that, that was possibly an adoption, that when it was a drier season, wet being a more tolerant plant to dry conditions, they increased their hectares and wet and dropped out other species. Um, I don't know which one you're referring to, but uh, the, this, the slides that which, um, I used to suggest lack of uh, adaptation is on the area planted during dry years and wet years. So it doesn't reflect on the yield, it's just amount uh, a areas planted. So, um, so the areas in the area planted for weeks. That's right. The dry years increase. That's right. Um, in the report, we'll cover on the yield side as well, and our, my recollection is that the yield has gone down as well, and the production has gone down in, in, in the drier years. So planted, but it's wasted, uh, and the yield is not higher. I, uh, I've got a question for Carl. Um, just around the fire weather risk. Um, uh, understandably, there's a strong focus on Southern Australia because that's where, where all, the, all the fires happen and, and you clearly demonstrated the increased risk there. But is, is there anything you might say going from almost nothing on a, on a graph to something starting to appear as you move further north into the subtropics, uh, you know, the more summer dominated areas where typically you don't associate with much fire risk in the catastrophic sense, but, but is that likely to start appearing as, as fire weather, weather risk areas? So we've got fixed climate, climatological reference sites for the forest fire danger index and for the grass fire, grass fire danger as well. So if we look at the what we call the cumulative forest fire danger index, so that which is summed up over the whole year from July to, to June basically, um, there's no sites with a decreasing trend. Um, there's, they, they're all increasing but the most significant increase is in the southeast. If we look at um, the top 10% of extreme FFDI days each year, there's only one site in Australia at Brisbane Airport that's decreasing and we think there's problems with that siting. So um, it's pretty much everywhere. The, the difference between um, the impact of that is, is really the fuel loading and what's there. So um, large fires burn through the subtropics every year mm. and there's more fire activity there than anywhere else but it's mostly open woodland and savannah yeah. so um, <coughs> there was a talk this morning which showed um, hectares burnt in I think it was um, in one of the forestry tours mm. um, it's really interesting that you know from 1939 then you went to the, the mid 60s to have a large area of Victoria burned um, then we went 2003, 2006, 2009 mm. and we've got, still got fires burning out in East Gippsland probably mm. won't go out until the end of March um, so, uh, the increased fire um, potential phase is transient in climate change until the vegetation fuel changes. Um, acacias need about 12 years for regeneration and some eucalypts about 20. So, um, but in, in warmer climates you get less fire activity than you do in cooler climates. So one of the ways we track cool times in the historical record is to actually look at ash and dust in the atmosphere. And um, yeah, you have drier 
cooler climates with more fires in them. But the transient um, phase um, in rapid global warming means you'll have hellish fire activity for a period, basically. OK, thanks. Um, we've just got maybe one last question up the back corner there. Um, I wouldn't trade on, a, on an exchange, but I would enter a private contract or a private treaty with where you've only got two players, me and someone else. Um, the less government intervention, I think, the better in those, in those markets. Um, the more they're legislated, the less they work, I guess. Let free market do it. I also, which I didn't really mention, was the biodiversity thing. I think that we will move from soil carbon trading to biodiversity offsets. Um, there's already moves for that in the US. People like Ducks Unlimited have signed huge biodiversity deals with Chrysler. To um, they, do, they don't own the land, they just maintain the biodiversity. They still shoot ducks on it, but you know, $50 million contracts just to maintain the biodiversity where they shoot ducks. And it's that's the type of that private private treaty type stuff that I see that, that you'll be able to do something. We're too probably too small to trade ourselves. We need to aggregate say a million acres in northern Australia. So if you can if you can get a million acres, which isn't I mean that's large, but it's it's not undoable of people actually managing their country in a sustainable fashion. It's quite stable, long term. I can't see a problem with that, especially when you're talking biodiversity. Mm. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, well, we'll wrap up the session now. I'd like you all to join with me in thanking uh, Carl, Hillel, Natalie, and Chris for the presentation. And uh, thanks for your participation and again to the Bureau of Meteorology.